Hello, everyone. Good evening and welcome to this, the fourth live streaming EKU Chautauqua presentation sponsored by Eastern Kentucky University's nationally prominent honors program and housed in the College of Letters, Arts and Social Sciences. My name is Eric Liddell, Chautauqua Lecture Series Coordinator, and I am delighted to welcome this evening Morgan Marietta of the University of Massachusetts Lowell to give tonight's presentation on the subject of his recent book, co-written with David Barker of American University, One Nation, Two Realities, Dueling Facts in American Democracy, something that is perhaps at the forefront of many folks' minds during this election season, and as we anticipate the final presidential debate, which takes place later tonight. So this will be a good warm up for that, for those of you who will be watching. Uh, now you don't see her on screen, but I also want to uh, welcome and uh, as it were introduce Dr. Janie Whitehouse of the EKU Communication Department, who is uh, going to uh, join us for the discussion in the Q&A after the conclusion of Dr. Marietta's remarks. Uh, Morgan Marietta's presentation will uh, take the first part of the hour and then Ginny and I will return for some question and answers and uh, some discussion. And I want to alert uh, the audience out there, our viewers, uh, that they are encouraged to submit comments and questions right here in the YouTube chat or via Twitter at EKU Chautauqua or by using the hashtag EKU Chautauqua. So I will be checking those and I'd be happy to share comments and questions with Dr. Marietta at the conclusion of his remarks. Full details of this year's Chautauqua schedule are on our website and you can follow us on Facebook and Twitter for updates and reminders. I wanna thank the sponsors of this event, which include the departments of government, psychology and communication. And naturally, I also wanna thank our presenter, Dr. Morgan Marietta, who is Associate Professor of American Politics at the University of Massachusetts Lowell, where he studies the political consequences of belief. He's the author of four books on political beliefs and ideologies, including A Citizen's Guide to American Ideology, The Politics of Sacred Rhetoric, A Citizen's Guide to the Constitution and the Supreme Court, and most recently, One Nation, Two Realities, the topic of his uh, presentation tonight, which was published by Oxford University Press just last year in 2019. Morgan Marietta is a regular commentator at The Conversation, and together with David Barker, he writes the Inconvenient Facts blog at Psychology Today. So welcome, Dr. Marietta. Thank you for joining us. It's a pleasure to have you here at EKU Chautauqua. And uh, without further ado, I will go ahead and turn the screen over to you and uh, fade into the background. And I will pop back in later with Dr. Whitehouse for some Q&A. So take, take it away. Thank you all so much for having me here tonight as the opening act for the presidential debate. Uh, we'll try to have a more civilized exchange uh, than they've been having. And I had given strict instructions to the moderator <coughs> to mute Eric's mic if he tries to interrupt me. Uh, I'm actually glad of the timing of this right before the presidential debate, because so many of the things that you're going to see tonight, if you watch that debate, reflect what we are going to be talking about here tonight, which is our polarized perceptions of reality that have become a dominant fe feature of American politics. It is a form of polarization, but a more advanced form. It's not just polarization about party, or about ideology, or about location, or culture, or religion, or media, or wealth, or all the other things that we're polarized about, uh, but a more advanced form of polarization about perceptions of reality itself. Uh, what David Barker and I, who uh, wrote one of these two realities with me, called doing fact perceptions. So the first piece of bad news that I have for you tonight uh, is that if you were expecting these kinds of dueling fact perceptions to go away once Trump is no longer the president, either in 20 or in 24, depending on how this, this election goes. Uh, I don't think that's going to be the case. I don't think it's about Trump. I also don't think it is as recent as that. 
uh, David and I started studying this phenomenon back in 2012. And what started it, it started these whole rounds of data collection that we started then, <clears throat> was this sense that we had that about things like climate change, people were diverging about how they understood reality. Even though the evidence was moving in one direction, perceptions were not moving toward consensus, but really quite the opposite. When we started studying this more about what was happening in regard to many different politically important facts and what was causing it, it became clear it was in full force way before Donald Trump came on the scene in 2015. Uh, I do think that he rode that wave. He might have even made it worse, but it wasn't him. And I think it is going to continue way beyond him because the fundamental dynamics are still there. Uh, the good news for me and Dave is that we turned out to be right. Uh, <laughs> every once in a while, uh, it happens. We were not right about Trump. Uh, both of us actually thought that Donald Trump would not become the Republican nominee. David famously told his classes at American that he was positive that Donald Trump could not get the Republican nomination. Uh, and that if he did, he obviously didn't know anything about politics, Dave, and he would resign from his job at American. I assure you, he is still teaching an American. Uh, but fortunately, we were right. The divided perceptions of reality would continue to grow over time. So if it's not Trump that is causing it, what is it? And the clearest answer is that it's us. If there are any directions for fingers to be pointed, it is back at ourselves. What we really found in studying this is that the causes are not external. It's not necessarily leadership by politicians or by media. It's actually internal. We are doing this ourselves through a set of very powerful psychologies that lead us to project our values onto our perceptions. And our preferred values guide our perceived facts. Uh, so, uh, let's do this tonight. Let me open up with a few comments about dueling fact perceptions themselves. I then like to talk about the election and the disputed facts that are really at the core of what I think this election is about. Then I'd like to summarize a few of the book's arguments about these three facets of social science. Uh, when I teach social science method, what I talk about is the three C's, the causes, consequences, and correctives. Normally, Social science is talking about one of those things or two of those things. We try to talk about all three of those and give a comprehensive view of what is causing doing fact perceptions, what the consequences are, and can it be corrected? The short version of the book is that the causes are deeply entrenched, the consequences are quite severe, and the correctives do not work. Uh, so uh, after I talk a little bit about that, I'll stop with the bad news. And then I will move to some very bad news to end out. And then we will move to questions. So the first thing I'd like to talk about tonight is the relationship among truth, facts, and trust. Truth, facts, and trust. To begin with trust, that is the heart of this whole problem and conversation. Trust has been falling in American society for over a generation now. Uh, every metric, every institution, whether it's government, media, universities, corporation, churches, public schools, everything, all sources of authority and all sources of information are not trusted as much as they once were. So why is that uh, such a problem? Trust is so important because of the distinction between truth and facts which are not the same thing, though we would very much like them to be, but they aren't. Uh, you might recall that the New York Times had an advertising campaign started a few years ago called Truth is Hard. CNN had another one called Facts First. Truth is hard and facts first. And it might sound like they're talking about the same thing, but they're actually not. They had very different messages. According to the New York Times, uh, truth was difficult. It was actually quite problematic to sort out what was true and what was not true. CNN, on the other hand, was telling you that they were going to give you the facts first, that facts were actually uh, maybe not easy, but much easier than the New York Times was saying that it was. And they were giving really two pitches because it might sound like they're talking about the same thing, 
uh, but they're not. Truth is what is really the case, the actual state of the world. But the problem is, and always has been, that we don't have access to truth. From the very beginning of philosophy and science, it's been clear that our ability to actually capture the truth is very limited and very disputed. Facts are not the truth. They are human approximations of the truth. They're the closest that we can get, but often we don't get all that close. Uh, you can define facts as the conclusions that are supported by the best available evidence and endorsed by the institutions of our society. They are supported by the best available evidence and endorsed by our social institutions. Anything that is not supported by the best available evidence and doesn't have that kind of endorsement is definitely not a fact. Uh, but the problem is even things that do seem to meet those two requirements often are not the truth for the simple reason that our evidence is not always available. It's not very good. It can actually be error laden. And those institutions are often not trusted and sometimes actually not trustworthy. One of the great lessons of science as a process is that we're supposed to be quite willing to reevaluate our facts and see when they're flawed and shift them toward the truth. Uh, but we all know that that's not true, that most people don't actually do that. Uh, one of the old lines in the sociology of philosophy of science is that science often doesn't really move closer to the truth by persuasion. It moves closer to the truth by people dying off. The, the senior faculty who are holding on to their uh, truths do so to their graves. That, that's how science advances, when senior scientists leave the field, not when they change their mind. Uh, so uh, this reminds me of one of the very important phrases about facts that you often hear, which is that facts are stubborn things. Facts are stubborn things. This is attributed to John Adams, one of the founding fathers, second president of the United States. Uh, and now this is not Sam Adams. Sam Adams' facts were a bit more uh, blurry and such, uh, but John Adams, he was a sober man. And people quote him that of course, facts are stubborn things and the truth will out. What they forget is that he said that phrase when he was the defense attorney for the British soldiers at the Boston Massacre. The facts that John Adams was saying were stubborn were the facts that those British soldiers were doing their jobs, they were attacked by the colonials and they committed no crime and should not go to jail. The Boston Massacre was not a massacre. That's the fact that John Adams was talking about. Interestingly, it's the exact opposite fact that I was taught in school. It's probably the exact opposite fact that you were taught in school, that the Boston Massacre was this egregious event by the British soldiers and led rightfully to the uh, revolution. The facts that John Adams were talking about, uh, those were not stubborn facts at all. They actually were distorted rather remarkably after the fact. If you go back further, the other metaphor that I think is very, very valuable in our contemporary understanding of facts and truth uh, goes back to very early Greek philosophy and the allegory of the cave. This is one of the first things, many of you know this, uh, many uh, philosophy and social science students are taught this, that according to Plato, Socrates, and of course we don't even know Socrates said this, Plato said he did, maybe he did, maybe he didn't, but Socrates described human knowledge like this. We are in a cave chained and our heads are held facing away from the opening of the cave. So we can't see what's going on in reality. We can just see the cave wall. And as people walk past the cave and events happen, they cast these shadows onto the cave wall. And that's all we see is shadowy representations of reality. And we try to figure it out. The meaning of this is that knowledge is hard. Epistemology is hard as the New York Times would say. It's very difficult to know what is true and what isn't. We tend to think that modern social science has brought us out of the cave, but I would argue that that's really not true. Uh, we still are in the contemporary cave. We do have a world of dueling facts. We do have not a, just a marketplace of opinions, but a marketplace of realities. And the reason is on our cave wall that we look at, we don't have just one image 
as Socrates was talking about. We actually have two images. We have a television on our cave wall and it doesn't just show us one thing. It shows us at least two different things. If you look at CNN, it tells you one thing. And if you look at Fox News, it tells you another thing. We are perhaps in a worse situation than Socrates thought we were because we have these competing facts that we are told are true in the marketplace of realities. And that takes us from truth and facts back to trust. The reason that trust is so important is that we can't figure out these facts ourselves. We don't actually have personal access to things like climate change, to things like the true facts of racism, the true facts of the national debt, the true facts of all these things. Uh, so we have to rely on trust. We have to trust media, we have to trust universities, we have to trust government officials to tell us these things. And because we don't trust these things, facts have divided in this remarkable way. Uh, so with all that in mind, let's talk about the election. Uh, the 2020 election, I think, has illustrated a fantastic degree of dueling fact perceptions. All of the ones that David and I studied and we talk about in the book, climate change, racism, whether the national debt is a problem or not, whether uh, marijuana is dangerous or not, whether gender differences are real, the origins of sexual orientation, whether vaccinations are dangerous or not, state of the economy, the threat from terrorism. But the 2020 race, I think, has three dominant dueling fact perceptions. One is about race, the other one is about the pandemic, and then the other one is about the election itself. Uh, about race, let me show you something here. These are some data that UMass Lowell Polling Center uh, developed. These are from August of this year. And if you were thinking that about the police shootings, uh, here we're talking about uh, George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, many of them going back to Trayvon Martin in 2013, all of the ones in between. We asked this question on a national poll. These are uh, data from YouGov, um, gold standard public opinion data. Some people think police involved shootings raise important questions about race. Others think that race is getting more attention than it deserves. In other words, these things really aren't so much about race. Do people think that they are in fact about race or that they don't? Uh, if that answer seems obvious to you and you're thinking that everyone you know agrees, everyone does not agree. 44% uh, of Americans believe that these events really are about race, but 43% of Americans believe that they really aren't. We are deeply, deeply divided about these facts. The other one that I think the election is very much about, of course, is the pandemic. Oh, before I move on, uh, the other thing to really see in this is that these perceptions of facts are not just divided, they're deeply divided by party. Here you see that uh, Democrats, 72% think that these events are in fact about race and only 15% don't. And Republicans exactly the opposite. It's 78% and 14. Deep, deep divisions in reality. When it comes to the pandemic, it's much the same. Uh, just like race, you can frame the question in a whole bunch of different ways, uh, but it all comes down the same. This question, this is from Ipsos, uh, another very solid source of national data. This is from July of this year. Around July, there were about 200,000 COVID deaths in the United States. If you believe that, according to the CDC, one of our authoritative institutions, that people simply do not believe. The question that was asked is, do you believe that this number is real or is it high or low? Americans in general are divided in about thirds. About a third think the number is too high, a third think the number is too low, and another third think it is reasonable. But again, dramatic divisions by party. When you ask Democrats, uh, is the number of real deaths what has been reported at 200,000? 61% of registered Democrats think that more people have in fact died. The CDC is intentionally reporting a lower number, or if not intentionally, at least reporting a fake number, where only 9% is the opposite. And then of course you find the direct uh, opposite set of beliefs among Republicans. 58% think 
that the numbers are way lower than 200,000 and only 16% the other direction. Truly remarkable how much we see the world in these dramatically different ways. The last one that I wanna mention about the election, and I think you're going to hear a lot of this tonight in the debate. You'll definitely hear the first two as well, uh, but you also hear about this one. And it is the dueling fact perceptions of the election itself. There are two different theories afloat in the land and they are upheld by two completely different groups of people. Uh, either the election is characterized by voter suppression or voter fraud. From the democratic perspective, there's a great deal of intentional suppression of the vote by different actions of the Republican party. UML did a different poll, uh, again, national representative data in which 75% of Democrats, 75% believe that Republicans are cheating in the election, mostly through voter suppression. The opposite story is true among Republicans. They believe that voter fraud, the um, uh, false voting, especially in mail-in, is really the story that is going on. Completely opposite perceptions of the reality of the current election. Another facet of this, and one of the consequences of dueling fact perceptions, is that scandal is essentially dead. I uh, believe that political scandals will be much more toothless into the future for this simple reason. In order to have a scandal, an effective one, it isn't just that your people think that a certain set of facts occurred and wrong was done, but the other side has to agree or nothing will happen. And we are moving away from the ability to have true political scandals. And you see this as well in the 2020 campaign. One of the major scandals that is not is Trump's taxes uh, and the widespread reporting that he paid very little, $750 uh, each year for the last few years. And the reason that this is not uh, the scandal that it might be is that uh, people who are inclined toward the president think that that's either not true or not relevant, but mostly simply not true. And why would they think that? Uh, because it was reported by the New York Times and the Times is not giving the actual um, copies and data and they're not saying where they got it. So anyone who is a Republican will tend to look at that and think, well, obviously the, I, I don't trust the Times. They won't even tell me how they got it and probably got it illegally. And uh, they're not even showing it to me. I have to trust them and I don't trust them. And the exact opposite is true in regard to uh, say Biden's business dealings. And just in the last few days, we've heard a tremendous amount, or maybe you haven't, but uh, there has been, depending on which uh, media outlet you look at, uh, tremendous discussions of Hunter Biden and uh, Joe Biden, their connection to China and to Russia. Uh, but again, people will not take this seriously and these will be scandals that are not. The last thing about the election that I wanted to mention is the shy Trump effect. And this is a disputed fact or disputed set of ideas among the pollsters and the polling community. And it essentially goes like this. If the polls are accurate, Joe Biden is about to win rather historically, maybe about 350 electoral votes. And most people in the polling community think that the polls are accurate this year where they were a little bit wonky in 2016. And again, trust went down. But there is an alternative fact in the land that there are shy Trump voters, which means people who don't want to answer these polls because they know there is social disapproval of supporting Trump. So if that's true, then people are less likely to answer the polls if they're Trump supporters. And there's about a 5% group that is being missed in the polls. There is an alternative dissenting pollster, the Trafalgar Group. And Trafalgar Group says that they have figured out how to measure shy Trump voters and that they're real. And that President Trump is in fact going to win re-election. Now here's the thing about this disputed fact about whether the polls are accurate or not. We're going to find out 
we're actually going to know, uh, maybe not election day, but maybe a week after, we'll see how that goes. But we have an empirical referent and the polling community will find out that they're either right or wrong. And Trafalgar is either right or wrong. And that is an excellent thing because we will be able to settle this disputed fact. About most of them, we will not. And it will continue on into the future. And I think it will continue to get worse. Uh, for the reasons I'd actually like to talk about now, way beyond the election itself. I think these trends will uh, continue to get worse and worse and spiral, unfortunately, more and more because of the causes, consequences, and the failed correctives of dueling fact perceptions. Let me spend a little bit of time on each of those, and then we'll go to questions. Let me first talk about the causes, because I think this is actually maybe the biggest point of One Nation, Two Realities, and maybe the biggest thing I think that is influential. And the causes then explain a great deal about the consequences and the lack of effective correctives. The causes are essentially not external, but internal. As I was saying a moment ago, uh, we should point the fingers at ourselves about this. In the political science world, there are two schools of thought about doing fact perceptions. The one is that they are much more external, that it's about partisan leadership and it's about media influence. Uh, we find, however, if you actually study this with survey data and see the statistical relationships that are going on, that it's actually much more internal of people's values dictating what they perceive. We perceive as true the things that make us feel good about ourselves. And how do we know this? Uh, we know this because if you actually measure people's value systems and then their partisan identities and their media consumption, and you look at how it causes different perceptions of facts, it is true that partisanship has an effect and media leadership, but the stronger and more consistent effects are people's internal value systems. Any way you measure it, you can measure values a lot of different ways, uh, but they always directly tell you what people are going to perceive. It's also the case that values explain a broader range of dueling fact perceptions. There are some fact perceptions that simply are not partisan. Vaccines uh, is one. You might think that the anti-vaxxers are more left or right, but that's not true. They are both um, hippies and libertarians. They are left and they are right in relatively equal numbers. Party ID does not explain anti-vax. Uh, it is explained actually by some deep-seated values that people have about the nature of purity. The same is true about the national debt. Perceptions that the national debt is truly problematic and we should be worried about it are not predicted by party. They're predicted by underlying values. So what's going on here? Why is it that we project our values onto our perceptions? There's a great deal of psychology underlying this. And to summarize it uh, in a quick few minute form, psychologists talk about cognitive psychology and they talk about social psychology. Cognitive being the errors and biases of your mind and social psychology being our habits toward conformity. So you have error on one side and conformity on the other side. And I think one of the great lessons of political psychology is that sometimes cognitive psych pushes in a certain direction and social psych in a different direction. But when they push in the same direction, start betting money on it. And that's what is happening here. In terms of cognitive psychology, uh, the core argument is that we're rather selective about our processing of information. We're very selective of what we pay attention to, selective in what we accept, selective in what we remember, selector, selective in what we repeat. And what this leads to is very selective perceptions. People refer to this often as motivated cognition or motivated reasoning. But that always begs the question of, of course, reasoning is motivated, but motivated by what? And the answer is motivated by your value systems to accept the things that make you feel good about yourself and your beliefs. And motivated by social groups. And this is the social psych part. 
people deeply want to be accepted by their social groups, whether it's family or professional or religious or anything else. It is much, much easier to agree with the people around you and change what you believe than to change the people around you. You're stuck with your social groups, uh, but you're not stuck with your perceptions. It's much more costly to annoy everyone you know than to believe something different. One of the things that is very important to remember is in the early experiments in psychology, many of you know the ASH experiments, and this is where they gave those lines on the walls. And they had some Confederates who would say that line A was the longest one when it's obviously line C. And they would see if the person would conform to other people, which they almost always did. Those were conformity experiments about perceptions. And they were so successful because that's one of the first things that people will change to suit their group. Another aspect of this, by the way, is not just cognitive psych and it's not just social psych. It's also evolutionary psych. It's really the trifecta pointing in the direction of projecting your values onto your facts. Uh, there's a very important new set of developments in evolutionary psychology. Uh, there's a guy named Dan Mercier who's responsible for what's known as the Mercier thesis. And the Mercier thesis is that reasoning is for arguing. Our minds over the evolutionary span were constructed not principally to get things right, but principally to convince other people that we were right. Because the way to survive in the world wasn't just to perceive accurately, it was to be high in the social hierarchy. Being high in a social hierarchy accepted by your group is what kept you alive in the hunter-gatherer world and probably in this one too. And what that means is your mind is kilted toward good arguments, not good realities, persuasion over accurate perception. And what that means is that people are designed for bullshit. And uh, that is a technical term uh, within the uh, literature on information and misinformation and disinformation. If you have never read uh, a famous book called On Bullshit by Harry Frankfurt, I deeply recommend that you do. It will change your life if you have not read it yet. Uh, this is not me swearing that that might happen. This is a technical term, bullshit, is when you are not lying. Lying and bullshit are different. It is when you simply don't know or don't care what is true or false. And you are making an argument to make yourself look better. You're not trying to be right or wrong. You're trying to make yourself look funny or interesting or accepted by the group. Uh, and the Mercier thesis is that our minds are actually designed to do that much more than they are designed to do anything else. And what that means is that cognitive and social and evolutionary psych all take us in the same direction. There's one other part of the causes that I wanted to mention very briefly. Dave and I developed another uh, psychological theory. It's one of our contributions that I wanted to mention uh, about intuitive epistemology, epistemology being how you know something is true. It isn't just that we project our values onto our perceptions uh, through these kinds of selective cognitions and social connections. It's also because our values shape the, the questions that we interrogate the world with. It isn't just that we arrive at different answers. We actually start with different questions. For example, if one of your values is fairness as a priority, when you look at the world, you'll ask if there are violations of fairness and mistreatment. On the other hand, if the value that really matters to you is purity, you will look at the world and ask if there is degraded behavior. And because you look at the world and ask different questions, you do get different answers. And what we found in some really interesting studies is that if you uh, start asking people and questioning, finding out their values, and also find out uh, the habitual questions that they ask of the world when they look at events. It's very clear to the case that people's values dictate their habitual questions and their habitual questions dictate their perceptions. And again, this is why your preferred values end up framing your perceived facts. Uh, so what does this mean? What this means is that the causes of dueling fact perceptions 
are much more internal than external. And what that means is that they're not easily fixed by reforms. If it were the case that we could fix them by changing politicians' behavior or media behavior, that would be different. But because they're so internally driven, it is very, very difficult to do anything about this problem. And moving to the consequences, that makes the consequences more problematic. There are more obvious ones and less obvious ones. The obvious ones are that we have no meaningful deliberation if we can't agree on facts. If we can't agree on where we are, we can't meaningfully discuss where we're going or have coherent policy about race or climate or the economy. Uh, scandals die off, as I mentioned before. There are also social consequences though. And this is actually one of the other contributions of the book. Uh, David and I did some of my favorite experiments I've ever done on this, uh, where we asked people, if you are starting a new project at work and you have a choice of people to work with, uh, there's this guy, Bob, we invented this guy, Bob. And we said, well, you don't know Bob, but you might work with him on this project. And you can tell your boss if you want Bob or if you wanna go back to the pool for somebody else. Uh, do you want to take Bob? Uh, and then we said, well, of course you do what everybody would do. You look at his social media, you look at his Facebook, you look at his Twitter. And we created these fake Twitter feeds that were revealing of Bob's perceptions of reality about race, about climate, about many different things. And this is what we found. Uh, if you ask people if they want to work with our man, Bob, if uh, his perceptions match your perceptions. Uh, 90, 95% of the time, people are perfectly willing to work with Bob. But if not, it drops immediately down to 40 or 50%. Dramatic drop in our willingness to have anything to do with Bob, even to work with him. Don't want to have lunch with him. Don't want to talk to him. Uh, people systematically believe if Bob has different perceptions of reality, that um, he's kind of shady, might be lying. He's pretty stupid uh, and they do not trust him. What this means in terms of consequences is that we have a spiral of declining trust in our society. Declining trust has led to dueling fact perceptions, but when people recognize dueling fact perceptions, that leads to declining trust. And there's a tremendous social as well as political aspect of these problems. So what about correctives? Let's talk about what we can do about this, because every good social scientist wants to contribute to fixing rather than just talking about problems. And I wish I could do that. I really, really do. Uh, but the known correctives simply do not work. And that's why we are pessimistic about this. The two big ones, I would love it if uh, there were other ones and people developed other ones. The two big ones that are discussed in political science and popular discussion are fact-checking and education. Let me talk about fact-checking a bit. Uh, our studies and most of the studies that are done say that fact-checking is not effective. It has some positive effects on restraining politicians from lying um, or having a bit of influence in uh, that aspect of politics. So they're not entirely not positive. But in terms of affecting people's perceptions of facts, they change nothing. And the essential reason for that is that the people who should be reading fact checks do not read them. The people who read fact checks are the ones who already agree with what the fact check is saying. The rare times that someone does read a fact check that disagrees with what they think, you can predict what will happen. They criticize the source, they do not trust it, and it does not, in any of the studies that I'm familiar with, change how they see realities. Uh, now, what about education? Let us end with this. This is the last thing that I really wanted to talk about. Is it the case that if we educate people, especially college graduates, the whole idea of college is that it teaches people to think more for themselves, to look beyond their initial inclinations, to gather evidence, to have more savvy about what evidence is legitimate or not legitimate. So the hope and much of the prediction would be that more educated people 
come to more of a consensus about facts. But you may be anticipating at this point that that is not true. Uh, in our studies on this, it's been very clear that the more educated people are, the more effectively they project their values onto their perceptions. And why is that? It's because they're more cognitively skilled. Uh, what does the university really do? It teaches people to be more skilled and more confident, more hubristic in themselves. And they use these skills that we give them to more accurately translate their values into their perceptions. And the reason we know this is true is that um, in a statistical analysis that connects this variable to this variable, if you introduce an interaction term and you see the influence of a different variable of how it changes that relationship, does the relationship between A and B get stronger or weaker as this other variable increases? It's very clear that as education increases, the close connection between values and perceptions goes way up. Uh, this is something that educators resist. I resist it, but yet uh, all the evidence says that it is true. A couple aspects of this. The first one is uh, populism. Populism as an increasing political movement, especially on the right in American politics, is actually about epistemology. I think a lot of people don't recognize this. It is not just an argument that the values of ordinary people are the ones that are more virtuous. It's also an argument that the perceptions of ordinary people are the ones that are more accurate, which leads to a distrust of elites, especially distrust of academics. It leads to distrust of media, but especially academics, because academics are associated with liberal politics. People are aware that faculty are by and large on the left rather than the right, that's a true fact. Uh, and the people who are aware of that do not trust academics. Another very important aspect of this is about the degree of information. It was always the great hope in the internet era that with more and more available and inexpensive information, people would educate themselves more. But the great problem is that we now have too much information. Information has risen to such a degree that sorting it out and making sense of it is the problem, not getting it. And you know what I'm about to say, that people use their values and their priors to sort through this, decide what they trust and what they believe and what they don't. Aldous Huxley, he wrote Brave New World. A lot of people think uh, that this is very similar to Orwell's 1984, but I actually think it's better in the sense that what Huxley argues is that you don't need the boot heel of the state if you can just buy people off with pleasure and drugs. It's the more subtle version of information totalitarianism. Uh, one of the great lines from Huxley is that life is short and information is endless. Life is short, information is endless. The widely available information uh, is not going to help us without a gatekeeper of the kind we used to have in academia and media. Uh, and what that means, uh, to quote another famous commentator on American politics, Walter Lippmann from the 1920s, this is now a hundred year old quote, but it's still uh, remarkable. The usual appeal to education can bring only disappointment. The usual appeal to education can bring only disappointment. And I'm sorry to say that, but I think it is true. So uh, to summarize everything that I've been saying tonight and let us go to some questions. Um, Dueling fact perceptions are here to stay. They are our fault. Not necessarily that of institutions and elites, but it is the falling trust in institutions and elites that is leading in that direction. But it is our own psychological mechanisms of projecting our values onto perceptions. That is the problem. The role of education is much more limited than we would hope. And I apologize uh, for being so pessimistic tonight, but it was a pleasure to talk to you. And I uh, invite any questions that you have. Thank you so much, Dr. Marietta, uh, for that very clear-eyed 
and uh, eye-opening uh, presentation. Uh, and yeah, I want to welcome Dr. Jenny Whitehouse uh, joining us here. And um, we have some questions scrolled up already on um, uh, YouTube, the YouTube chat which I'll get to in a moment because I know that Ginny has something in mind. Yeah. Um, so go ahead and get us started, Ginny. Well, I had a two part question. Um, one is, if I wanna make sure I'm understanding you correctly, is you're saying essentially what we see, perceive is true is formed by cognitive dissonance. Uh, well, the, the cognitive dissonance part comes in, in the connection between the cognitive and the social. The cognitive dissonance argument is that you can't really deny what you do, but you can change what you think. So you don't want to deny your social contacts, your mental perceptions, much, much more malleable, especially when you add in the evolutionary part that your mind is pretty well trained to make clever arguments that impress people. And it likes those a lot more <laughs> than it likes the reality ones. So yeah, yeah. It's your own mind, cognitive dissonance and many other effects. And I didn't even do the whole catalog. Uh, there's, a, there's a chapter in the book that really runs the whole catalog of these psychological effects. Uh, but they all point in the same direction, including that one. So what if an ins when institutions that we have traditionally trusted give us facts that we disagree with? Uh, we are deeply able to dispute them. Uh, one of the uh, tests that we ran that uh, David designed this one actually, I thought it was really quite interesting, was uh, uh, if you do fact checks that are exactly as you talked about, that are in favor of what you would think. We took advantage of, on the Democratic side, the uh, Hillary Clinton supporters um, and the Bernie Sanders supporters and how people responded to fact checks that were against their inclinations and in favor of their inclinations. Mm -hmm. And uh, if someone was a Bernie supporter and um, the Washington Post said something in favor of Hillary, like, no, nah, it's, it's, just, it's just a lie. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, people are very good, even if it's a trusted source that they normally would trust. And the reason we were looking at Democrats, they, it was valuable with the Clinton and Bernie distinction. But also those are people who tend to trust the Washington Post or uh, the Washington Post fact checker, or they tend to trust PolitiFact, but not if it goes against them. It, uh, we're remarkably malleable. And again, education does the same thing. The more educated you are, the more you think, oh, no, 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 I know. They're normally right, but not about that one. Uh, and this is the sad thing. I, I'm, I'm, I was deeply disturbed. Dave and I went round and round about this when we first started finding this, because both of us want to believe that education works. And of course, it works in other ways. Well, I would also believe fact checking works um, as a as a journalism professor. Yeah. But that's that's a really thing. Well, I have more questions. But yeah. Eric, I'm sure, let's go ahead and hear from other people as well. Yeah, well, I was interested to hear you say, Morgan, that um, people have ways of disputing rather than refuting, right? Traditionally, you would think that people would need to refute something. In other words, actually convince themselves that they have good reason to not believe something. But what you're saying is they just need to go through a, a kind of set of mental tricks in order to provide even a superficial reason to dismiss something. Hmm. I think that's right, actually. One of the really interesting parts of selectivity is we think of it in the one phase, but it's in these many phases of what you pay attention to and then what you accept or reject, and then also what you remember. People systematically forget about the things that went against them, and they oversample in their minds and remember the things that are in their favor. And then when they talk to people, they're much more likely to hear themselves say, oh, this is another fascinating thing, that if you dispute something with someone, the fact of them arguing against you and they hear themselves arguing, that convinces themselves, even if they have a weak argument. Uh, the, the refutation doesn't have to be that good in their own head. You're, you're a genius in your mind. Right, so I mean, is that a classic social psychological defense mechanism that keeps us you yeah. said earlier that people like to feel good about themselves and their own yeah. opinions, and there's this reinforcement that goes on. Yeah, that's the interesting connection of values. One of the things some people have 
a, a, a difficulty sort of wrapping around how your values would influence your perceptions of facts because values and facts seem so much different. <clears throat> There's the intuitive epistemology about the questions that you ask. But the part that's quite central that you mentioned is that if you have a certain value, you want to think of that value as important and right and true and yourself as virtuous. So you want to see things that make that value important. So if you really care about equality, you are biased toward seeing inequality, not seeing equality, seeing inequality, so that that value has an important role in the world and you are virtuous and your value is lionized. And uh, there's no question that that's what people do. All right, thank you. Uh, we have some questions from the YouTube chat and there's a couple that I'm gonna to combine together here. Now you've obviously touched on this to some degree, but uh, here's a crisp direct question. How do you define fact? Yeah, yeah, no, this is actually something that is one of the deep um, issues of all of this and trying to have a clear-minded definition that you, you mentioned, um, Ginny, about uh, journalism, faculty, political science, psychology, there's certain differences here. Um, but a fact, there's some dispute, but I think the best definition of a fact is the one that I gave that it is the conclusion that is supported by two things, the best available evidence and the authoritative institutions that back it. And when those two things happen, we say this is a fact, which is to say that it's the best approximation of reality we have right now. We're supposed to be open to changing it later if it turns out to not be true. But if we have evidence and authoritative institutions, universities, media say that's right, it, we call it a fact. But th this is deeply laden with problems. I think it's the best definition we've got, but often the evidence might be disputed. This is very common in social science that if you look at one data set, it looks like this. If you look at another data set, it looks like this. The, or sometimes we just don't have a lot of evidence. Sometimes we have too much evidence. Uh, sometimes different disciplines dispute this. Uh, by the way, uh, Jenny, this uh, uh, it might be somewhat heartening to you. Uh, uh, the political science and the psychology faculty tend to not agree with the journalism faculty about the efficacy of fact-checking. Uh, journalism faculty are much more um, optimistic about it, especially about its ability to adapt and change. And uh, th they're more optimistic than I am. Th if you read the literature mm -hmm. on this, there's a distinct division between journalism and political science yes. faculty on this. And part of it comes down to this. It's actually a disputed fact. Uh, journalism uh, professionals tend to take it as a fact that journalism professionals are seekers of the truth and are disinterested. They don't have uh, biases and they're, they're professionals. Uh, political people don't believe that. We look at all institutions and we think that people are power seekers and ideologues. The idea that government people are obviously power seekers and all of our theory in political science says they're power seekers. And the idea that people in journalism, oh no, 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 they're, they're high-minded noble people who seek the truth but are not power seekers. We think everybody are power seekers. And the power that journalists have is to decide what's true and false and tell other people what's right and wrong. Well, journalism is advanced a little beyond a simplistic view of objectivity. Uh, that might be oversimplifying it quite a bit, but that's all right. I'll go with the fact that, poli that political scientists believe that all people are power seekers. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we, would, we would tend to say that. Now that could be wrong a bit. Um, but yeah, no, it's fascinating things going on in uh, journalism about the argument of whether the both siderism uh -huh. has been dismissed and uh, uh -huh. people should attempt to engage uh, in this. And the, the, the new journalism of fact-checking, it's, it's really quite revolutionary in exactly the terms you're saying, that it's, it's rejecting some of these older ideas. Absolutely. But a lot of these facts are deeply in dispute, even among different kinds of professionals. I always find that fascinating when you see different disciplinary facts. Can, Eric, can I go ahead and ask yeah. my journalism question now, since we're kind of on that this role? Um, and forgive me if I've knocked somebody around a little bit. No, I'll um, get back to it. Go ahead. All right. We 
no people seek out media organizations that share what they perceive as their worldview. Yeah. I mean, that has been documented again and again. People, if they interpret, they, they find organizations that they believe share their worldview. But even if they agree with it, credible media get hit if they call out mis political misinformation as biased, they get hit if they take a neutral view, they get hit mm -hmm. if they do data-driven horse rate coverage. What exactly should credible media be doing now? What yeah. should reporting yeah. look like? Yeah, um, credible media, especially fact checkers, should have very clear written public protocols. Well, yeah. For, no, no, they don't, they don't. Not even political fact, politifact? No, in my opinion, no. Uh, okay. And some other people's opinions, yes. My opinion, no. Okay. Because what they don't do is they don't say, this is how we frame questions. One of the big black boxes of what questions they ask and why. One of the deep criticisms of fact checking and why people don't trust it is that if you read fact checks, and this is definitely true of PolitiFact over time, and see how they frame questions, they'll say this statement, could it be understood to be true? And if you ask the question, could this be understood to be true? Is there evidence that it's true? You can find evidence that it's true. But if you also framed it, could this statement be understood to be false? You can find credible evidence that it's false. And they tend to pick one or pick the other one, but they're not honest about it or open about it, which one they have picked. And then they are not honest and open about which sources they use, uh, how they decide which ones, and how they reach the conclusions. Uh, mm -hmm. Not nearly enough uh, in my mind to satisfy people who would question them. And I think one of the best things you could read on this there's a guy named Lucas Graves, uh, who has written some of the major work uh, from journalism faculty on the institution. And he's much more supportive of it than I am. But he's deeply critical of this point, which he has pointed out, and he's completely right. If you look at PolitiFact and you add up their assessments of Republicans and Democrats, which one do they say lies more? Oh, I, yeah, I know this one. Yes. So they say no question, they say Republicans lie more. Yeah. But all those institutions also claim that they don't do that. Mm -hmm. They will not conclude that Republicans lie more. And Graves has pointed this out in detail, totally right. They say that they're honest actors and always tell the truth. So if they're honest actors and always tell the truth, they have to conclude based on their own methods, if they're legitimate, that Republicans do in fact lie more. But for the reasons that you said, they say, oh, no, no, we're not saying that. Hmm. Because then they'll be attacked by people on the hmm. right. So they maintain their legitimacy by saying, we're not saying that, even though we're saying that. Hmm. And uh, that's not honest. Okay, this, this, this does not scratch the bullshit detector. And Graves is right about this. Uh, if they openly admitted what they did, um, it would be much better for them. But they don't have credibility. So what you're saying then is every even political politifact and other fact checkers need to admit their own biases. Yes. Okay. Openly and honestly. Yeah. In a systematic way. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah. All of this reminds me of what uh, I think the French philosopher Jean-Francois Lyotard called the crisis of legitimation. Right. And, you know, he was speaking of this in the 1980s, I think, but it had precisely to do with trying to find the discourses of truth that could be trusted, broadly speaking across the spectrum, right? The political spectrum, the social spectrum, the cultural spectrum, et cetera. And, you know, continuing on with that notion, like in this general context of a problem of, um, you called it uh, authoritative institutions or legitimacy, um, let's say that someone wants to get out of the contemporary postmodern version of Plato's cave that you described earlier. How would we do that? Uh, the one question from uh, the yeah. chat is, what resources can we use that will allow us to obtain facts that actually bring us closer to the truth? Do those even exist? And maybe you've partly answered that question, but it's interesting to hear it framed exactly like that. How could we actually do this if, let's say, in, as individuals or 
as groups or parties, we were really interested to take that leap and overcome those things that you were describing earlier that are preventing us. You know, how, where would we look? I have a partial answer, though I don't believe I have a very good one. I, I wonder if Jenny has a better one, which she very well might. Uh, my partial one is that the, the norm that people follow is exactly as Jenny's saying, that people pick a, a, a media institution and follow it. This is a direct line into reinforcing your own biases. You should toggle back and forth if you watch television. Um, I do this actually routinely, is toggle back and forth between CNN and Fox, literally 10 minutes, 10 minutes back and forth. It is um, educational. It's shocking, not just the different presentations of the same story, but literally the different realities they talk about on a given night. You would think it was a different country that you were watching based on the different things they discuss. It's really quite something. Uh, I think that's also true about print media. People ask me what the centrist, non-biased, non-ideological media outlet is. I don't have one to give them. I think you just have to have a very broad spectrum. In terms of psychology, um, uh, one of the things that I didn't have a chance to talk about is the reliance that people have on personal knowledge. There are a lot of reasons psychologically where people rate their personal experiences to be more real than anything they see media wise. And if they don't trust media or government, they will more deeply fall back on personal experience. That will systematically mislead you. Your personal experiences about race are notoriously wrong. Uh, I'm here in New Hampshire, uh, the Shire, as I call it. You know, I teach at UMass Lowell, but I live across the New Hampshire border. Um, the experiences about race in very white New Hampshire are, the, the personal experience is not translatable to the rest of the country. And uh, falling back on personal experience is one of the worst things you can do. So I think overcoming that is particularly important. Those I think are the two best answers. I, you can say you just fight your own psychology, but fighting your own psychology is, is hard to well, do. Well, if I could interject, one way to do that is to read fiction and watch movies, right? By directors, you know, uh, from different viewpoints. You know, I remember a number of years back, we had Kwame Anthony Appiah here at EKU talking about his book on cosmopolitanism and kind of uh, analogous to, you know, this, this problem of how to overcome your own bubble, right? Get out of your own bubble or overcome your own biases or not fall too prey to your own tendency to reinforce your own values or beliefs and certainly not fall back just on your own experience. He recommended, you know, watching a foreign movie every month. And, you know, as a literature professor, I would say analogously, read a book, right? About a different cultural experience than you are used to. And so, you know, this is another track that you can take, not just looking for, let's say, um, uh, genuine bona fide facts that are gonna lead you to the truth, but, you know, other constructions of experience that you get in fiction and film that can, you know, in their own way, speak to or testify to um, other forms of the truth. I totally agree with you. I agree with both of you. You're both right. Oh, great, thank you. Well, then we can move on to, uh, we've got another question or two here. Um, uh, let's see, um, one uh, colleague of ours asks or says, and then asks, I would guess that most people cannot clearly articulate their values. How do you measure people's values and how can we assess others' values in the course of a conversation? Not, not scientific research, but um, how do you assess, how do you measure people's values and how do we assess others' values in a conversation with them? Oh, oh see, now that, that second one I find to be really much more interesting. But let me answer just the, the, the first one first. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, political psychology, people use a bunch of different methods of measuring values. Uh, whether you think you're talking about personal values or political values, there's about three major ones. Uh, Jonathan Haidt uses the moral foundations, and these are the ones about uh, purity, care, harm, etc. We have very solid measures of these that can be done on surveys. They're very, very predictive and I think very accurate. Uh, the other one is the uh, Shalom Schwartz uh, measures, which are that value wheel you might have seen that uh, sort of uh, universalism and other values that are in this uh, pattern. Uh, those are um, 
not moral values, but personal values. Uh, what we did in the book is measure them. We used all of them. Uh, we used in different rounds of surveys. We were doing national surveys in 2013, 14, 16, 17. Uh, and then we also used directly political values. And these are things like individualism versus collectivism and secularism versus religiosity. Those can be measured by asking which of two concepts you feel are more important for society, like um, science or faith, or uh, cooperation and helping others, uh, or uh, self-interest. And you can gauge how people see these things. So the measuring values is something that can be done, even if people are not deeply aware of them. When you're talking to people, you know, that's really interesting of how we gauge other people's values. This is similar to the Bob experiments. Uh, often we can't tag people's values as quickly as we can their identities. And we backfill from their identities. Not often correct though. Uh, you can assume from people's racial identities or ethnic identities or their occupational identities that you can fill in their values. And that is what people do. Uh, it's not always that accurate, but that's how we do it. And uh, these days, I think we actually take people's perceptions of facts and backfill it into values. Mm -hmm. Once we hear what people think about, uh, say, climate change, we start predicting their values backwards from that. Uh, I think that probably more accurately, actually, than with uh, identities. But we're very judgmental these days about people's values right. as well as identities as well as facts. Um, another question here has to do with what, um, aside from purity and fairness, uh, which you mentioned, what other value distinctions do you identify as fundamentally dividing Americans? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, on the domestic side, the individualism versus collectivism is a huge uh, divide. People who essentially think that you're responsible for yourself, Mm -hmm. uh, versus people who think that we are responsible for the collective. That is a massive one. Uh, the religious divide is remarkably powerful as well between secular and, and uh, religious. Um, what would I think? Um, the moral values, and this is going in the job and height direction. One of his basic insights is that there are more actually conservative ones. The conservative ones have this broader range. Uh, the liberal ones are more limited to emphasizing uh, care, uh, worried about how uh, people's welfare and emphasizing equality. And those are the two core values of the left. And uh, those are dramatically uh, divided between liberals and conservatives. Uh, liberals are very focused on those two values. But conservatives are much more focused on purity, uh, loyalty, authority. Uh, and uh, the, it, it's, it's hard to exaggerate how divided Americans are on these. Well, that Even when you do very simple scales. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, I get it. I was just going to kind of, I was going to kind of build upon that to ask a question that I had in mind um, about independents and, and or what are sometimes called swing voters mm. and the role that they play or where they fit into your um, analysis, right? The schema that you've laid out here, because we, you know, not just recently, we know going back decades, um, the real fight, right? And a lot of the advertising and even some of the lines in debates are really geared towards that sliver in the middle. <laughs> right. And I, I gather that it's been getting smaller and smaller, which is, uh, you know, evidence of your thesis, right, that we yeah. are becoming more divided and entrenched and yeah. polarized. But, um, you know, how and where do swing voters or independents who are still open and receptive to debate fit into your schema? And um, well, I'll, I'll leave it there for now. And I have a kind of follow up. Yeah, yeah. Uh, talking about how they fit into the electoral politics. That's something actually David could give you a much better answer on. Uh, it's not really entirely my specialty, but the general political science view of it is that they are smaller and smaller. They tend to be either people who are just not informed 
very much at all about politics and therefore they're not just really very engaged people or they're an alternative sort of ideology and think of themselves as independents. Uh, but they play less and less a role in this. Uh, what you're going to see tonight is trying to gain participation from the base much more than persuading anyone. Uh, I was just talking to Josh Dick, who's our, uh, the head of our polling center at UMass Lowell. And he was saying one of the most important things about the polling of 2020 compared to 2016, very few undecided voters. There were about 9% undecided voters going into the last contest at the end, and now it's down to three there aren't a lot of people wow. who are not decided. It's one of the reasons why he argues, when we were saying about shy Trump voters, he thinks the polls are quite accurate because there aren't a lot of undecideds left. In terms of, not elections, but in terms of perceptions of facts, independents are actually one of our strongest arguments uh, that David and I write about this. Because even people who are not partisan aligned, their value systems directly predict their perceptions. You don't need partisanship to do it for you. Your values will do. And people who call themselves independents for a variety of reasons, they have strong values like everybody else. Uh, it's not that they don't have values. Sometimes they are more mixed in the sense that all their values don't line up conservative or line up liberal, which is a completely reasonable way to live. We tend to be very polarized and make these assumptions about the groupings, but there are reasonable humans who have mixed values left and right. Uh, and when it comes to a specific perception of fact, their values will predict how they perceive it very accurately. That makes sense. Thank you. Uh, and I guess this is kind of related, you know, something that popped up on my radar in the past couple of days uh, was a discussion um, by the uh, economist Robert Frank uh, from Cornell University. He happens to have been here at EKU as well in the past at his Chautauqua. Um, but just the other day, he suggested that what he calls, and I guess is a term in psychology, behavioral contagion um, may, may be at work and partly explain uh, uh, Biden's widening poll margins in the past sure. few months. And I guess how it works is this, and I, I just want to get your opinion on this notion um, in relation to, you know, uh, values and polarization and the possibility that some people could change their minds or switch, um, or maybe it, it actually still is in accordance with their, their deep core values. But he thinks that what's going on is that as more um, Republican operatives and elites, um, uh, you know, former Congress persons and senators and so on, military officers, conservative uh, leaders across the country are coming out against Trump and for Biden, that mm -hmm. behavioral contagion makes it easier for people to jump ship, to put it that way. Um, you know, going back to the, the problem of conformity that you talked about earlier and that, so this is something that may be at work here. And so I guess my question is, do you see that as a realistic, if not antidote, just sort of partial um, hedge against dueling perceptions. That is to say, there are people who would see themselves as firmly in line with one side or the other, but can find themselves uh, brought over by behavioral contagion or you know, the, the groundswell, right? That appears to be going on. It makes it easier for them to say, to convince themselves, it's okay for me to make this decision. I'm not alone. Um, and so the argument is that that's what's been going on and it may increase leading up to election day if that's what's been going on. Uh, yeah, yeah. I don't wanna overclaim knowledge of that particular literature about behavioral contagions. Uh, there are definitely things that are moral contagions. That's an idea that I'm very familiar with that is definitely true. And it tends to operate in small groups. If someone has a certain uh, uh, dominant idea and other people will conform to it. I think uh, in re my reaction about how much this kind of contagion might affect the election is that uh, most of the evidence says that people are deeply concerned with what their social group thinks mm -hmm. and will think of them much more than they are about the broader society. Uh, people who are professionals who work in a certain 
Malou need to maintain that kind of respectability. Uh, people who belong to a certain church group need to maintain that. A uh, certain uh, tight ethnic neighborhood need to maintain that. Your personal connections are the dominant ones. Uh, so if those start to shift, people do shift with them. Uh, the, the problem with dueling facts in the whole nation is that we are so deeply divided of social groups now. And the partisan and social identities tend to coalesce. Uh, so that's why we're so divided. If we became of one dominant group, then that contagion would bring people to consensus. But this is why we don't have consensus at the current time, because we actually are deeply divided in this way. You know, that people have much stronger social bubbles than we used to. People have fewer and fewer contacts across the partisan and cultural divides. Uh, it's actually one of the great problems in uh, US culture and politics. Morgan, you, I, I'm really intrigued by the statement you made about moral contagion. Mm -hmm. I think it's a really interesting argument. Can you give a, an example in a political context um, from a, a, a more concrete example? I think your, your hypothetical is great, but can you give me a, a concrete political example? Oh, yeah, yeah. No, we're, we're living in one. The BLM movement is what well, right other now. than this. Oh, BLM, okay. Oh, yeah, no, 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 we're living in it right now. Uh, okay. One of the questions that is deeply impolite and nobody likes it when I mention this, so I don't know if I should, but um, if you ask people uh, about the, the, the changes in perception that they have had just over the last couple of years, that they have changed their views about police brutality toward African-Americans, and then you ask them, which is not polite, Five years ago, do you think that police were not doing this? Do you think this wasn't happening five years ago? What, were, you, were you dumb five years ago? Or were you, are you, what, what happened that, uh, and I think one of the big answers is video. I think it's, it's the power of these videos uh, because it is less deniable than everything else that we're talking about. Uh, so you can have these surprising uh, moral shifts uh, in time. Okay, so the public opinion has shifted really dramatically about this. Now you, can, you can talk about how much of it is honest versus how much of it is for show, but it seems to have switched very quickly in a moral contagion sense. But then the video is what is making it credible. The yeah. video then is the fact that people are working with as opposed to an opinion, yes? Yeah, well, it's a combination of video and the social pressure to take a position that is morally accepted. Uh, if people start to shift, that causes other people to shift. If, if yeah. their social group <clears throat> demands it. Okay. But you'll see it in some social groups more than other social groups. Well, that's why it can trick you. That's why when I was showing those data, did those data surprise the two of you? When I've shown this to a lot of people, they're really quite surprised that half of America does not see these things about uh, race yeah. and half of America does see them about race. But a lot of people live only in one of those groups. So they're, they're, they don't know as clearly that the rest of America sees it in a very different way. Well, it, anyone it, who has done any journalism work knows that everybody's always mad at you on both sides. Mm -hmm. But more than that, if you put two different groups together, that are of opposing opinions, they will each swear that the media is for the other side. So I find that consistent with that experience. Yeah, that's right. Because they're selectively perceiving what mm -hmm. they hear in media. Yeah. I wasn't surprised, but only because I listened to your interview uh, with Tom Martin of WEKU oh, Radio, yeah. which I'll take a moment to plug as well. Um, if you go to uh, the WEKU radio page and look at Eastern Standard, you can hear uh, a really interesting interview with Morgan Marietta done by Tom Martin of, uh, of WEKU. And I think that's going to be airing on uh, the radio itself uh, in snippets next week as well. So, um, and we thank them for being a partner in yeah. the Chautauqua series. Um, but in general, yes, it did surprise me, right? Um, you know. But um, let's see, uh, any last comments or questions uh, from you, Ginny? No, thank you for being with us today. 
Yeah, thank you all so much. This is actually one of these great enjoyable events. Again, uh, one day I aspire uh, to come out uh, to Eastern Kentucky and actually see the campus and see people. Uh, well, I love that part of the country. Great. Really, well, you, know, uh, you have an open yeah. invitation, yeah, a continuing invitation. And I'm, uh, I don't mind saying publicly that uh, if or when you get here, um, I will uh, make good on my offer to uh, have you sample our bourbon. I that, think I, pro I think I promised you that by email. Um, yeah. uh, as so soon as I got the invitation, the first thing I envisioned <laughs> was that after the talk, we were going to sit around with some of the political science journalism faculty and have a good bourbon at some local. Yeah, water. we usually do it's that. Like um, get it here. It's just that it, when you're next to the source, I think it, yes. it, it, it's, it's, it's. And better. we usually have a few uh, choice varieties that you can't get across the country. So, um, yeah. you know, we'll keep in touch. And uh, again, you have an open invitation to come here for you know any reason. Um, we can make that happen. Uh, so uh, let's see. Thank you to our audience out there and thank you for your questions. Thank you, uh, Janie Whitehouse for joining us here for this discussion and Q&A session. And uh, thank you, of course, uh, Dr. Morgan Marietta of the University of Massachusetts at Lowell for the presentation. I encourage everyone out there to uh, look him up on Amazon and Oxford Press and other places to uh, check out his books. Um, you can find links to those uh, various places on our uh, Chautauqua website where you can also find information about our next um, Chautauqua, which is one week from tonight, also related to American politics from a slightly different angle. Uh, we will have Kieran O'Connor, John Wood, and Carolyn DuPont of the Braver Angels organization, uh, which is devoted to promoting, uh, maybe recovering, uh, with hope against hope, uh, civil discourse in American politics. So uh, it's one attempt at a corrective at the very least. And we'll have a discussion about that on uh, virtually the very eve of the election. So join us for that one week from tonight at 7.30 p.m. You'll find the link on our webpage. And uh, till then, everybody take care and stay safe and uh, join me in thanking Morgan Marietta and Jenny Whitehouse for being here again. And um, with that, we bid everybody good night and um, enjoy the presidential debate if you're moving on to that. Yes, I will get the bourbon and listen to the debate right now. <laughs> okay. So, uh, Jenny, Eric, everyone else, thank you very much. Take care. Thank you. Good night, everybody.